I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Happy Saturday and Semana Santa weekend, everybody. It is the holiday weeks here in Nicaragua, and I had a number of people send in questions and comments, and so we're going to be covering some of those for today. So we're just going to start going down a list of some interesting ones that people brought up. I didn't get a ton, but I got enough that need enough of an answer that I think it's a perfect day to do some Q&A. We're going to kick off with a little bit about understanding the difference between safety and security and why you need security here in Nicaragua when it's so incredibly safe. That may seem counterintuitive, but trust me, it is absolutely logical and should be obvious if you have the time to stop and think about it. And if you look at the questions that people have asked in the past, so we're going to get to that and more, including the cost of a house in Granada to give you an idea of a range right after the bump. Right. It is Semana Santa weekend. It is very warm. I did have someone make a comment that they thought the it was a theory of reading thermometers and that it wasn't actually warmer. They actually took the time to post on the channel to argue about the reading of thermometers and that it wasn't warm. I, I, we get some of the weirdest comments. All right, so someone asked the question because we had uh, one or two videos uh, that you can go look up about, like if you have an apartment or you're gonna leave a house for a long period of time. And it's worth noting, something that people tend to do, expats do, here in Nicaragua, actually a lot of locals do this too. There's just a tendency in Nicaragua and probably lots of other countries to leave houses, full houses, completely empty for outrageously long periods of time. And those are things that normal people don't do in the United States or in Canada or in Europe, right? It's just not very common to have a house that you're not having people live in. And because of this, a lot of people deal with the concept of having a long-term empty house in Nicaragua, or people who are looking at living in Nicaragua are dealing with the potential of having an empty house when maybe they've never had to deal with it before. And so this brings up some challenges uh, that you may not be aware of or thinking of uh, commonly because you don't deal with it in normal life. All through my childhood, I lived in upstate New York. My parents never went and bought a second house. When we would leave our house empty, it was always kind of a big deal, whether we were going to visit my grandparents in Ohio for a week, or we were going on vacation for two weeks to Maine or to Florida. Leaving the house locked up and empty was kind of a big deal. You had to find someone to watch the dogs. Normally you'd take them somewhere or you'd have someone come and stay. We never had someone come and stay. We'd always drop the dogs off somewhere, but we had horses. So every day or maybe every two days, someone had to come and make sure their water was full, make sure they had fresh hay. Sometimes they even had to clean out the barn and stuff. We had cats, they had to be fed. All kinds of animals had to be taken care of. So we never had a time that our house was going more than maybe at a max 72 hours without having someone come in and check in on it. We lived there so we had family and friends who could do this and that's what most people did back then and I'm sure it's what most people do now so when you have an empty house even for a couple weeks for most people even in the US and Canada you have someone go and check on it uh, or you have a neighbor who can look in maybe you don't have pets and they just make sure it's not on fire it hasn't flooded something like that when I lived in Texas we were always worried about things like well if it was during the winter we might get a cold snap and suddenly have pipes freeze you gotta leave water running and do all kinds of things but you can't do that in anticipation of it freezing because you'd have water running all the time and it may flood for another reason you don't leave a lot of things plugged in because it could start a fire there's just a lot of little things and you would get hail pretty much any time of the year or tornadoes in much of the year all these things cause you to worry a lot. My family in Houston always has to worry about hurricanes. Of course, only so many months of the year, but every year they have to worry about it. So even in North America, you're never leaving a house completely. You may have someone just, well, there's all these different things you can do to keep an eye on it. You may have security systems and you're keeping an eye on it that way if it's not pets. But one way or another, you're you're very rarely going to just leave a house. And people who I knew as a child who did that, they weren't really houses. They were leaving things like lake cabins that maybe didn't have running water, maybe didn't have electricity in some cases, definitely didn't have anything in them that you were worried about, and you were, were not worried about them getting robbed or squatters or anything like that. It just wasn't a real concern because there wasn't anything in them. So if you're in North America, you're dealing with that stuff. When I moved away from North America but had not sold my houses yet, 
I always made sure I had friends or family or something who were staying in the house or at least checking in on them all the time. At one point, I had people live in my house for several years and they, you know, got free housing out of it and I got my house watched over and sometimes they do some repairs or whatever because they were there for a long time and that helped out a lot. So I basically had a cuidador in the United States. So that's how you deal with things in North America. That's what we expect. If you were to say, well, I'm going to have a house up there. I'm going to leave it six to nine months at a time with no one checking in on it. I don't know the neighbors. Maybe the neighbors aren't around either. We'll just trust that everything's fine. People would say that feels really crazy and squatters over that amount of time could be a major issue because squatter rights in North America give them some advantage. If you are uh, doing that and have the answer, well, I'm going to leave the country. Everyone's going to know I'm out of the country. So they really know I can't check in on it. And there's a chance I'm not going to come back for years. I think I'll be back, but there's a chance I won't be back for years. You would be like, oh my gosh, I can't possibly leave my house. I have to have some kind of security. Could be a friend or a hired service. So when people are coming to Nicaragua, it is really common to flip that. Oh, having a house or having an apartment that you're going to keep and be gone for six to nine months and sometimes not come back for years. I literally went and looked at someone's house yesterday that they're interested now in renting out and it has been empty for years. It hasn't been 100% empty. They did rent it out to some other people uh, just from time to time. There's people in there once in a while, but they left many years ago and their house has not been watched over. They have someone to make sure that no one is breaking in. There's just a neighbor is keeping an eye to make sure that some really dramatic thing hasn't happened. But there's no one in the house. There's no one fixing plumbing problems. There's no one maintaining appliances. There's no one watching inside in any way. And the thing has become very run down and it, just as you would expect, right? But that's a common thing. You find that everywhere. I know so many houses of that are owned by expats and the people have left. And it has been in many cases four to eight years that they've not seen their own house. They're not back to deal with it. And their houses are in, are in complete disrepair. And, and generally they pay someone to make sure that the house hasn't fallen down, to make sure there's not a fire, to make sure someone hasn't broken in. Because at eight years, squatters start to become a problem for sure. Uh, but they, you got to do something, right? So here in Nicaragua, it is very common for expats uh, to, to buy and not live there full time. And, and that actually, when you stop and think about the economics of it, the, the reasons that people tend to do that, why many people are looking to do it as a pre-retirement plan, all that makes total sense. So it's a very logical thing to have happen, but because it's such a logical thing, such a common thing, you're going to run into this scenario really commonly where people who have never owned a second house or never had an empty house in North America are very likely to be looking at maybe having an empty house here. Maybe not for forever, but for some part of their lives. And so it brings up this question, how do you keep it secure when you're not there ever and especially when everyone knows you're not from the country and knows that you're probably out of the country and probably for really long periods of time it makes you a really high target for a lot of reasons and most people when you're having a house here are going to want to put things in it like a television and that makes it a bigger target as well whereas your lake house in new york when i was a kid they didn't have tvs in those things because it wasn't worth putting the money into it tvs were more expensive and those places were very run down so it's a completely different animal so because of this, it's very important to protect your houses from all the things I mentioned. Maybe you don't have to worry about hail and, hur and hurricanes and tornadoes, but you do have to worry about really heavy rains, strong winds, uh, fire, of course, and, and all those kinds of things, right? We just had a fire on the beach in the last few weeks. Those things are real. You, you do have to watch out for these things. Um, and of course, foundation issues, well, not common, do happen here, the same as most places. So just got to keep an eye on things. So we have to deal with a very common commonly here coming up with a means of security. And if you're an expat who is living here, the chances that you have neighbors who are going to stay around when you're not is low. And the chances you're going to have friends and family who are local and can just check in for you, or maybe a friend who's going to live in the house while you're not there are low. You might exist for sure, but it's very low. So not only is the opportunity for needing security very high, but the opportunity for having someone to just handle it for you is very low. And that combination means you have to deal with security in some other way on maybe a hundred or a thousand times more often than you do in North America, even though you would, in the same circumstances, need that security in North America just as much. So one of the questions was, 
if it's so safe in Nicaragua, why do you need security? Well, safety is about your bodily harm, right? It is very safe here in Nicaragua, comparable to or better than the United States. Especially as tourists, it's definitely better than the United States. So maybe as a, as a citizen, it's about equal. But if you're an uh, expat living in Nicaragua, your safety compared to the US is extremely high. So you have this great degree of safety. Do you need security to keep you safe? No, you do not. Now you can have it and make yourself even safer still. And a lot of people, because it's so affordable, want that extra safety because for the first time they can have it. And that's great. And having safety like we do, having a security guard just to do some convenience. Last night, literally last night, one of the dogs that's behind me got out and why did we know where the dog was? Because security was out there outside the gate and was watching and said, hey, the dog got out, it's over here, right? That's important for us because we have dogs. So dog safety and security is something that we pay for and it, very important to us because you may know we're very into our dogs. Um, that's something that we couldn't afford in the United States. Would we want it? Absolutely, but we couldn't afford it. When my dog escaped in the United States, she made it through the neighborhood and we only found her again because she came home, not because we had security out there whose job was to follow her. But here, just last night, they were out there to follow. So that is a really important thing. But so the thing that we have is not a safety guard, they're a security guard. Their job is to make sure not that we don't get stabbed. Of course, that is their job should that come up, but that's not why they're here. They're here to make sure that people aren't sneaking over the fence to come break into our house when we're not home. We don't want them taking our dogs. We don't want them taking our televisions. We don't want them going through our house. We don't want wild animals getting in. We don't want flooding to happen. And we don't want to have to open the security gate on our own. There's lots of reasons why we want a guard. I, sometimes we want to be able to take food delivery and I just don't want to stand out there waiting. The guard does that. So there's lots of reasons why you'd want a guard. And I think that when you're looking at it from a North American perspective, guards are so expensive. It's such an unbelievable amount of your income, possibly greater than your income, that the idea that you would have one for any reason other than absolutely keeping you alive would never occur to someone. But when it's so affordable like it is here in Nicaragua, people start getting it for reasons that are very different than you'd think. Of course, allowing us to keep the house, we don't have to lock the doors, we don't have to close the windows. The house is wide open. As I'm saying this, of course, it's the middle of the day right now, but the house is completely open in every direction. Every door wide open. There's no, not even a screen on the doors, but we feel completely safe. Even if we all leave the house, we can leave it like this. So the dogs can come and go, a cat can come and go, whatever, because we have a security guard. It allows us to leave the house absolutely open. And when I go for walks and do things, I don't carry keys. You can't mug me on the street and get my keys and get into my house because I'm not carrying keys. The guard opens the gate for me. And thank goodness we have the guard to do that because just yesterday someone threw a deadbolt on it and had there not been a guard on the inside, my keys wouldn't have let me in. That's a separate issue, but great thing that that exists. But that's why we have security guards is for security of our stuff, watching over our house when we're not here, watching over the dogs when we're not here, watching over people getting out, watching out for weather and emergencies and taking deliveries and all those things. And of course, they do provide additional personal safety as well, but that is a bonus. I don't know anyone who would pay for that here. But if you're coming from a US or Canadian perspective, generally they are so expensive and your concern is your safety, not your security, that your mind goes there and just assumes that that must be the problem. But we're safe here. That's not a real concern, but people will swipe things, right? Just because we're safe doesn't mean that your cell phone sitting on a table isn't a target. But because we have a guard the way that we do, I can sit outside in the garden. I can leave my laptop out here. I can leave my cell phone out here. I can leave my cameras out here. And I do all the time. I don't have to worry about anything because there's no way that someone's gonna be able to steal those things. Even though I'm safe, they would not be. So that's, that's really important. That is why, security guards and security mechanisms and cuidadors are such an important part of life down here. And it's worth mentioning, cuidadors do more than security guard in a taking care of your house aspect. They often take care of things like uh, fixing plumbing or electrical or painting or roof maintenance, those kinds of things, because they're a caretaker, not a security guard. And that's the primary thing that people use, because for normal things, they protect just as much as a security guard does, but they're also tasked with uh, maintaining the house in a physical manner. And in hot climates like this, you do tend to find, especially near the beach, that houses wear out a bit faster than they do 
uh, North America or things in the house, I should say. The houses themselves here are generally concrete and last for forever. Uh, but the issue is that the, the plumbing, the electrical, those kinds of things, uh, lamps, just furniture, that stuff tends to take a lot of abuse because of the really high temperatures uh, and the what little bit of humidity we have. There is some, uh, all that gets to it. And if you're near the beach, the salt water is terrible. Uh, you put all that together and, and you really does make sense that you want someone watching over that stuff all the time, especially if it's gonna be nine months until you're back. Things are gonna wear out during that nine months from just sitting around. Certain things will be fine, certain things will not. And so you want people to watch over those things. And like that house I said, their foundation shifted. Now they're closer to the beach, but their foundation shifted and it needs wall repair, things that you actually have to put concrete on at times, um, but the building is fine but it does need to be maintained or else it's going to start leaking water and then there's going to be more damage and you don't want to come in after a few years and find out that a $100 maintenance fee to put in concrete and paint a few things and, and patch a roof would have protected you from $5,000 of, of walls falling down and, and roof being torn off. So it's a very important thing for that. Our second question was, I'm looking to potentially get a house in the middle of Granada. That's the tourist city southeast of the capital. I'm wondering what the price range should be. So this is a loaded question. Let's imagine you're asking this question in New York. Well, what does a normal two to three bedroom house cost in New York? Well, on the low end, about $50,000 and on the high end, about $50 million. That's a really large range. And so it's all but useless to talk about what the price of a house is. The size, the craftsmanship, the exact location, all those things play in significantly. I have friends who bought houses in New York for under $50,000. And while you may say that must be just the worst thing ever, how do you even get a lot for that? They actually have pretty decent six bedroom homes. They're just older homes in a less desirable area, but not a dangerous one. So it's all about uh, understanding that there's an unbelievable range on things. So in Granada, one thing I can can say is that generally prices are 50 to 100 percent higher than they are in Leon. But if you don't know the prices in Leon, it's only going to matter so much. Generally, and very, very generally, for expats, if you're looking at a real Granada house, not one in a development, those are going to be whatever they are, they are. Uh, but if you're looking actually in the city, at a city house, at normal houses, not mansions and stuff, Granada has mansion row and it's amazing and you're going to pay whatever you feel like paying for those. But if you're looking at actual normal houses, my guess is that the absolute low end is about $50,000, probably in line here with Leon, just for the worst places. Uh, but on the high end here in Leon, it would be extremely rare to find a house in the city that you'd be looking at over $200,000 without getting into obvious mansions of like, oh my gosh, this is the craziest thing. How does this exist? But like really nice city houses, I mean, the $200,000 range, that means in Granada, you probably would expect to be more in the three hundred and fifty, dollars maybe even $400,000 range. But that's on the very high end for very large places. Uh, uh, but 50,000 is probably very low. I'm very much guessing, right? And, and every little thing that you say about your house, well, but I want this street, not the street next to it. Well, that could double the price. I want this uh, part of town rather than this part of town. I want this layout rather than that layout. I want new construction or old construction. Each of those things could make 100% differences in the house. And so, yeah, I bet you can find a place that's a two bedroom and livable for 50,000, but you probably won't like it. I bet you could spend as high as 400,000 and not be completely ripped off and actually get a at least reasonable deal on a house. But I would say that probably the range that you would really Really look at is probably more like 75,000 as the cheapest that is really reasonable and 150 to 200,000 is probably really good as an upper range. Of course that is for city houses. This is stuff in the desirable city center, the tourist core, in the marked as yellow on the map area. If you're looking outside of that you can get into the $150 starter homes in the normal Nicaraguan communities just like you can here in Leon. Maybe you'll pay a 10 or $20 uh, per month uh, premium if you're, if you're renting, right? If you're those are like 16,000 here. You're probably starting at like 18,000 there, 19,000 at a minimum, but very much in line because normal people with normal jobs have to be able to live there and afford it. So it can't vary that much. And tourism traffic doesn't really change its value in any meaningful way. So we expect those to be awfully close, just like they are in Managua and, and other cities. It's mostly construction cost uh, to do that. So uh, that's kind of the range. This is a very difficult kind of question to ask. And, and I understand why people need to know this, so I totally get it, but Remember, this is not the United States. There aren't comps. There aren't averages. Every house is absolutely unique. Every location, every everything. Now, 
because of that, you get people who are going to be like, no, but uh, Scott said that everyone's unique. This one's half a million and here's why. And those are going to be almost always Hail Marys. That is someone just coming up with a wild price, hoping that you have no idea what value would be. Uh, but uh, so you need to look around a lot. You need to do a lot of due diligence. You got to really understand what the market's like. You got to know every street. You have to know those things because which ones are nice and which ones are not, which ones are expensive and which ones are not, are things you won't readily be able to tell. It would take a long time getting to know a neighborhood uh, to have that idea. But in the United States, I say this a lot, you can go to uh, Carrollton, Texas, where I used to live, and, and you could look at my house, you could look at my neighbor's house, you could look at a street over a street in any direction, and everybody's within two to four percent of the houses, and the house styles are extremely close. So the variance in total from the biggest house to the smallest house, from the best street to the worst street within my entire neighborhood at a variance of maybe 30 percent, maybe 40 percent for the very largest to the very smallest, and that was it. And that's a big variance, but that's an entire variance. Whereas if you're in Granada, that same variance over a much smaller area could be much closer to 500 to 1,000% um, and being completely reasonable because the houses are so different, the locations are so different. There isn't any this house is just like that house kind of thing. And so um, you can't really use averages. They're kind of meaningless, right? Both mean and median numbers won't really help you. It's understanding the range and all the factors that go into it are about the only thing. So the best thing I can say Say is, is I give you kind of a really, really general range and do it by comparing with Leon and what I know of Granada. But um, as far as realistically being able to gauge price, it's going to take a lot more work than that. You just can't work from averages. Okay, so this question is in the thread, and I honestly didn't see it until I was doing the video. So I've had no, I'm just going to read it. I don't even know what it says completely. How are single divorced moms looked at in Nicaragua? Are they frowned upon? Do men date divorced moms with children there, trying to get a grasp on the dating culture in that particular aspect? So this is actually interesting and unique. So I, I, it's um, it's a good question in general, but I think without knowing that it's a really interesting point about Nicaraguan culture, this is a perfect uh, topic. So here in Nicaragua, the first thing about marriage you have to say is that the normal people are not married. Marriage is not a part of the culture in the way that it is in basically any other country. I'm sure there are other countries that are like this. I'm sure there's ones that are more dramatic, but this is an extreme example, the most extreme of any place I know, where marriage is seen as simply a church thing and not a part of normal life. So if you grow up in, let's just say the United States or Canada or Western Europe, you're used to this idea that there is a family unit. They are a very stable thing. They get married and make that a legal aspect of their lives. So you have this really strong legal bond that is overseen by the government, but it is not a, uh, a civil thing. They call it a civil ceremony, but they are doing it on half of religious institutions. So marriage is a religious thing that is done by churches, but it is overseen by governments. So it is a, uh, the idea that you have marriage recognized by the government means you don't have separation of church and state, uh, basically anywhere, right? More or less all governments recognize the concept of marriage. So they are all tying into churches. It is a very strange thing that governments care about this and they probably should not because it causes a lot of problems. Here in Nicaragua, we still have that. The government does allow you to get married. That does exist and it can be on record, but they basically do it for people who feel they need to or people who have a legal requirement in another country. The only people I know who really get married officially here in Nicaragua are doing so because they're trying to get visas elsewhere. Otherwise, they don't go through the formality because they don't need it for anything. Here in Nicaragua, the terms are even different. Um, it is normal to use, and for those who are not aware, commonly through Spanish-speaking countries, we use for husband esposo and for wife esposa, or for married people esposos. That is the uh, standard terminology. But here in Nicaragua, that does not imply husband and wife. That implies a steady uh, boyfriend and girlfriend situation. So we would use it in, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, uh, but it would be like saying going steady uh, in the United States, at least in my childhood. That is what we use as the term here, esposo and esposa. If you want to denote that you are civilly married in the eyes of the law and that a church has overseen that, uh, and so it's all official and you would have to get divorced to break up, then you use the term marriage. Merido and Merida. You can use those terms in other Spanish-speaking countries, but they are used synonymously with esposo and esposa, not as two separate designations. Here, the terms of novia and novia are used uh, commonly for people who are engaged and plan to become Merido and Merida, but they're also used for more casual, we're not quite steady, but we are kind of serious dating, whereas uh, they're used for very serious in most countries. 
So the terms change because most people, when you meet people here in Nicaragua and they say, oh, we're married, what they mean is that they are esposo, uh, esposos. They are seriously dating. They cohabitate. People move in together sometimes after just one day of dating. You meet someone at a club, you, you, know, you go home after the club, and by the next day you're moving in together. That is a completely normal scenario. No one would bat an eye at that. Not everyone does it, but it is so normal that no one thinks anything of it. And it's, uh, you can go through my videos and we, we've talked a lot about the house housing situation and these things play into it, right? People don't have a lot of private space. They don't have their own places. So when you start dating someone and you have an opportunity to move in together, you jump at that. It is a very important part of cost savings and, and housing within the environment. So it's not as weird as it seems, but that means that you have people who are living together and presenting themselves as married and, and carrying on in shared income, shared expenses, who we would be like, well, you're just kind of casually dating in the United States. Well, that's it. The, the situation is different. So here, the idea that people are divorced or are single moms or are divorced single moms, putting that together, is not seen as a negative in any way. It is completely normal. It's the expectation. There's nothing wrong with staying married, but the idea that you would stay married with the person that is the you know parent of your child and that you would have this very stable, that is the exception, not the rule. It's not an expectation in any way. Of course, there's a lot of people who see it other places. There are people who would like to work towards that. They're hoping that that will happen, but the idea that it's an expectation basically doesn't exist. So uh, the idea that someone would look negatively upon it really would never occur to here. Like that's such a, a non-existent thing. So there's a bunch of factors here. One is that uh, women, it, men as well, but they don't gauge ages of, of childbearing by men. Women who are having children often start at much younger ages, having uh, children as a teenager and meaning before 18, like as a young teenager while you're still in high school, which remember you can go to high school to even 24 years old. So all of these numbers are different here. Having a, a child at 15 or 16 years old is not seen as weird or young. You may find people who are like, eh, it's a little bit on the young side. We don't have a lot of space in the house, but you have kids while you live at home. It doesn't matter if you're 16 or 26, you're probably in the same scenario, still in school, still starting a career, struggling to get a job, um, just getting started in life. Your parents are taking care of your houses and your parents are going to take care of the kids. It doesn't matter whether you're 16 or 26. So the factors that make North Americans create the social pressure to keep teenagers from having kids doesn't exist. And in fact, it flips, it makes far more sense for a 16 year old to have a kid here than a 26 year old, because that 26 year old is maybe going to have to move for a job, maybe going to be really busy with, with doing that. The 16 year old is just as healthy, just as likely to survive well through childcare, but will have 10 more years helping to raise their child, will be a bigger part of their life, will get to see more of their family and their parents will be younger to help take care of that child rather than waiting until they're really old. So there's actually a social push towards Towards the youth having kids rather than pushing towards older like we get in North America. So because of all those factors, all the uh, perceived uh, uh, negatives that the U.S. pushes for good reasons, right? There are many reasons why it's good for people to wait to have kids, but many of them have to do with the social economic factors of North America and how having children early can impact your education and jobs. And of course, we engineer things into the system to make that true. Those things could be fixed in North America and reverse that, just like here in Nicaragua. But Nicaragua does not have those engineered contrived scenarios to make it difficult for young people, especially young girls, to have kids. So any combination of single, has kids, had kids as a teenager, had kids as an adult, had both, had kids with multiple people, was married, is now divorced, was pseudo-married, is no, now separated. None of those things really come up on the radar. The expectation for men who are dating women over the age of, say, 20 is that the expectation is almost certainly they will have had a child already. They often doesn't come up in early conversations, but it is the expectation, not the, well, I suppose maybe she has kids. No, you'd be like, oh, almost certainly she has kids. It's absolutely normal, especially if you're dating outside of the big city, right? If you're dating someone who's a lawyer or a doctor and they live in the middle of Managua, well, yeah, the ages are going to skew up a bit. But if you're dating in most of the country, like here in Leon or in Granada or in Matagalpa, and you're dating someone who's in their 20s especially, the expectation is, well, that's way into the years to have kids. It's not, do they have a child? It's, I wonder how many they have and have they moved out? Do they live with their parents? And often it doesn't come up. People don't often take care of their own kids during dating years. So when they do have kids, it's not often a big dating factor. Um, so, uh, 
you have to come from a very different perspective. It's not we expect people to be childless, but know they may have children. It's the expectation that they have children and we know they might be childless. Uh, it is not that we expect them to have never been married. We expect everyone to have been what is classified as married. Maybe not marido, but esposo. Um, and, but that's expect it's expected because that just means did you go steady with someone of course you moved in but it's normal so the idea that someone is uh, married divorced married and not yet divorced was uh semi-married and is and is separated has dated has children has children with multiple all of that is completely expected normal and not really a major topic now once of course you are very serious with someone chances are they're going to know your life story and you're going to know theirs but these things do not carry the north american more they don't come with this uh, negative connotation in the way that it does in North America because in North America it's the exception, not the norm. Once, you're, once it's the norm, it's very difficult for it to have any kind of weird social uh, uh, problems associated with it because all the structures in life are built around that. And when you're you know, in your 20s as a man and you're dating a girl in their 20s and you tell your family, oh, I'm, you know, I met this girl, they expect her to have been married. They expect her to have had kids and that would not be surprising at all. If she didn't, it would actually be, with not having kids is completely normal, but if she had never been married or in some kind of classification of married, it would be, wow, that's really weird that she's never been married, right? So it's a, it's a completely different game in that respect. So you get, I think, a bigger range of experience. But at the end of the day, the answer to would this be a thing that as a, an expat, being uh, a mother, being single, having been married in the past, none of those things would, one, actually come up in an early conversation in dating and two, be something that you held back, right? It, it, that would not be the case at all. People would be like, oh yeah, no, I assumed, right? Like it, it's just not a, it's not a big thing. And if you volunteer that information, no one's going to be like, oh no, that's, uh, I'm not ready for that. It's not like that. Now, keep in mind that there is a certain expectation that lots of people help take care of children here. So there's a little bit more, uh, uh the village to raise the child. So men who are dating have a, a slight greater amount of helping to take care of children that are not theirs, but that comes at the price of there is an extremely large amount of men do not take care of children that are theirs. And so it's a very, very different scenario. And in that aspect, there is, I, I would call it a major problem socioeconomically in that the uh, biological fathers of a lot of children are unaware that they have children, not involved with those children, do not live in the country. And one of the things that makes that so dramatic is that such a huge number of working age men leave the country, either temporarily or permanently, uh, to either make a life for themselves abroad or to go far away and send money home and help support their families, that they are unable to be there physically for their children, even if they want to be. And that's a major factor, right? It's very often that they are not shirking responsibilities and avoiding being there. It's that they may be so diligent in their responsibilities that they can't be there. That's only one aspect. There's many cases where people just leave and, and that's awful, but that happens as well and with great frequency. But don't think of it in that way necessarily. Don't assume that that's the case. There are a great number of people who are very sad that they're not spending time with their children, but are living somewhere working very hard to support those children uh, from abroad or whatever, or just having to work in another town. And I know people who've you know had to travel hours, five, six hours to go find work uh, to support their children. And if they're able to get work, they immediately are moving back. I'm like, finally, I get to be with my kids, right? That's what's important. So you still have that. Uh, but again, everything in Nicaragua because of jobs and, and careers and economy and ages and school and which the, you know, school is free, college is free, all those things are so different. It creates all these factors that completely change. And because of the multiple gen multi-generational housing as the norm, the idea that you raise children on your own instead of being being just part of a continuum of multi-generations taking care of the children is so different that everything you think of as those aspects of dating and lifestyle and families, uh, you kind of have to throw out the window and approach from a completely new light. 
This isn't really a question, but I'm gonna read this because we just did the why are short-term rentals so expensive and this comment was left and it's a good one to read. We tried renting our place short-term years ago before Airbnb and such. Now, of course, Airbnb does make this stuff easier in some ways, but it also has some overhead. Uh, someone from North America rented it. And this is always the story. It's always someone from North America, Europe, something like that, that's the problem. They felt sorry for the po poor folk here and gave everything away, which is a really kind way of saying that they robbed them blind. That was the end of that. One item you left out is electricity and air conditioning. I, I think I mentioned the AC, but not in this, this context. Electric is higher here, and if you're not paying the bill, you tend not to care as much. Really think of it as just included in the rent. Yeah, so this is important. A lot of places here when doing short-term rentals, I think I mentioned this, but uh, I must not have. Uh, they keep the electric separate because if you have air conditioning, um, you have, you're likely to just be like, oh, it's included and leave it on. And I, I mentioned the story. I don't know if I wrote this or actually said it. I know someone who rented and, and the electric that their, their renter used, I'm sorry, they rented out their place and the electric used by the renter was greater than the cost of the rent because they use so much. And, and if you live here and you're, you're Nicaraguense or you're used to people like me, the amount of air conditioning that we use is typically very low. So even in, I have an apartment here, that apartment over the course of a month only spends about $10 in electricity. That includes the air conditioning, um, but it's run relatively little. It's a very efficient unit. It air conditions a relatively small space. Parts of the house do not get air conditioned. So it's relatively efficient. And so it stays at a low tier and it's in a low cost area. If you're in a high cost area and it's super hot and you want air condition a large space and you're not used to it, you may turn it down a few degrees, which can take the power usage up by hundreds of percentages. And if you're air conditioning all day, even when you're not there, because you want to come home to a cold house, because that's what we do in North America, then and you may be using an amount of electricity that people are not at all expecting, and it may change the tier that you're getting billed at. And depending on where you live, you may be getting billed at massively different amounts. City center to outskirts, one neighborhood to another can have wildly different electric costs. He mentions that electricity is more expensive here. That is true by the kilowatt hour in certain markets, but here in Sutiava, we're paying a fraction of what we did per kilowatt hour actually used, but what they put on the bill is only a fraction of the kilowatt hour. So it looks higher, but when you actually see how many kilowatts it is, it's lower. It's very complicated and it's very hard to compare because everyone gets different billing. And if you don't get it directly from the electric company, who knows what you're getting, but because of this, all of that is basically a background. Because it's so dynamic and it's so risky and because it is potentially such a giant percentage of the rent, over 100% of the rent, it is normal to have it paid directly by the, the renters and not pass through the rental company. Or if it passes through the rental company, they're just collecting it on, you know, it's, it's not built into the price because they want to put the pain of overuse on you. Because if they don't, Right. If you're renting, let's just say it's a $300 a month home and you use, let's say, $300 worth of, of electricity, you're costing them $600 a month. But someone else who comes in and is very diligent and only uses $10 is only generating $310 a month. And you don't want to punish the people who would only cost $310 a month and make them pay $600. They'll just go somewhere else. And the people who will use $600 they'll come to you still. So you don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense for your customers and it doesn't make sense for your business, but because it's such a large number, you can't build it in. So the only way to reasonably do that and have a fair price that's good for everyone is to have them actually pay for what they use. Uh, whereas in North America, it's such a tiny fraction of the cost that you can just build it in and it doesn't really matter. And we all tend to use the electricity more or less the same. All right. Mr. No Good says, where can I live on the beach around there? I looked online and couldn't find anything on the beach that's close to Managua. So the first thing is if you're looking online for beaches, yeah, that's great. But if you're looking online for apartments or houses, you're going to find nothing. We, we can't state enough. Stop looking online. It doesn't do any good. It actually hurts you. That's the thing that people don't realize. It actually will hurt you. The more you look online, the less you'll know about the market. But let's assume they're not looking for that. Let's assume they're looking for beaches. The simple answer is there is no beach near Managua. Managua is an inland city and not just a little inland, it's quite inland. So it doesn't have beaches. Technically, the Departamento of Managua has some beaches associated with it, such as Pocha Mill, but that is several hours away from the city. It's not what we would consider close. If you want a city with close beaches, Leon is your only option. If you want a little bit different than Chinandega kind of 
impressive, but the distance to a beach that we would think of as a beach is easily double that of Leon, which is not bad, but it's certainly a lot farther. Those are the only cities with reasonably close beaches. You can say that Rivas has some close beaches, but they're farther away, and Rivas is a much smaller city. You don't get that same city feeling like you do in Chinandega and Leon or Managua. So if you're looking at Managua, you're basically looking at the Pochamil area. So just go to Pochamil on the map, that's P-O-C-H-I-M-I-L, and look in the direct area around there. There's several beaches there. You're not limited to just one, but it's the Pochamil general area. That is it. You can see the highway coming in more or less from Managua. It's not super direct, but you're looking at hours of travel. You'll have to have a car. Uh, I don't know what the buses are like getting out there. There's probably a bus. A lot of Managuans go out to Pochamil. It's super popular with the Managua crowd, but it is a very long way. So it's a it's an absolutely different experience than you see here in Leon. When I show the beaches here, you're seeing city beaches. These are people who are able to live in the city and go to the beach in minutes, you can go to the beach for dinner. You can be like, oh, where are we going? Are we going somewhere downtown? That'll take us five minutes plus five minutes of parking. Or we can go to the beach. That'll take us 15 minutes, but one minute of parking. It's farther for sure, but it's not so much farther that you wouldn't just do it half the time. So it's really easy to include the beach as just part of the city. But no other city in Nicaragua can say that. So when you're looking for something close, you're not going to find that. that. That's just not going to be. If you do decide that the two-hour trip to Pochamil is something that you think is close enough and you're like, okay, I'm going to be in Managua and I want to be in its local beaches. Okay, look in that region. Basically, the only thing you're going to be able to do reasonably is walk up and down the beach, go rent a hotel down there, not the whole thing, just get a hotel room and spend some time, talk to people and be like, you know anyone who wants to rent a house, any Airbnbs in the area, anybody got an apartment, anything like that. And there's not much, but they should be something. There should be something. Uh, but you could also talk to hotels and potentially stay in a room long term and get a deal on that. That's an option as well. But the whole idea of Managua near a beach is fundamentally a problem. You might as well say, oh, I'm looking at Omaha, but where's the near beach? But there isn't one. It's not a beach city. So you're going to run into that problem no matter what. So any answer is going to be there isn't one close to Managua. All right, one last one. Dovi Good Guy uh, asks, how does political stability or instability in Guatemala compare to Honduras, Costa Rica, or Panama. So for those who are not aware, Guatemala has re recently gone through quite a bit of political instability. So it's a bit of a uh, concern to outsiders, uh, definitely a concern to Guatemalteca, but a concern to outsiders who may be looking at Guatemala that political instability may be a factor. So he's not asking how does political st stability affect your day-to-day -day life. He's asking how the, the stability ranks across the region. I'm going to imply that he probably means the former, so we'll answer both. Uh, so first of all, how does political, let's, let's answer exactly what he asked, which is how does it compare? So Honduras has some, uh, I'm going to call it simmering under the hood um, or under the covers uh, potential for political instability currently. There are some uh, concerns up there, and I'm not super versed on the Honduran political scene because it doesn't really impact us that much. I know it sounds crazy. It's just two hours away, but Honduras is not looking at any kind of potential for political stability that would have any potential to spill over any borders and affect the wider region. So we're not concerned in that way. What we're really concerned about is just how well they're handling general border control and, and things like that, and they seem to be moving in a good direction. So at the moment, we're not incredibly optimistic, but we're cautionally optimistic and keeping an eye on things. Like that, that's kind of Nicaragua's stance from my perspective, on Honduras. Um, El Salvador is doing amazing things. He didn't mention El Salvador. They're looking to be insanely stable at the moment. Uh, Guatemala, however, is super unstable. So uh, they just went through a contentious election. They had a big time uprising. They had a huge talk of whether they're going to honor, uh, whether they're even going to have a democratic state or not. And so they had a lot of things going on. And that, that leads to instability or at least perceived instability or the potential for instability, right? It may remain stable, but it's teetering on the edge. Um, and, and exactly how you define stability can be, can be a little bit of a gray area. Panama and Costa Rica, however, it's important to note that at the current state of things, both are relatively stable. And any country anywhere uh, has some potential for suddenly becoming a powder keg and, and changing rapidly. And what feels like a very stable situation can suddenly become one that isn't. So that, that's always a possibility. There's always some political uh, uh, player who's looking to make huge changes. And all it takes is one really great speech and suddenly the world changes. Uh, all it takes is one major international event and, and public opinion shifts dramatically. But under normal circumstances, uh, these tend to be relatively stable countries, especially in Panama post-takeover of the Panama Canal. Uh, and so uh, Costa Rica in general, quite stable. 
uh, politically and and Panama reasonably stable politically, uh, but neither is is having any major issues at this moment. So they are on the stable side of things. Of course, Nicaragua and El Salvador are very stable. Honduras would be the least stable within the region, except for Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Panama stable um, and 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 basically nothing to to discuss. Uh, and then Guatemala, major issues at the moment. So that's how unstable is it? But the implied part of this question, or that I'm guessing at least, is wondering how as a traveler, or more importantly as an expat, as a traveler you really don't care, as an expat you're going to be affected by the political instability or potential for stability or instability within the region. So great, let's dive into that. Um, in Guatemala, I think that everyone is affected by things like the protests and the uprisings and those things. You see roads closed and, and so forth, and those things tend to get scary if not outrageously inconvenient. Outrageously inconvenient, they definitely hit. Whether or not it was scary, I don't know. I don't know anyone who went to Guatemala and was like, I was worried while there, other than worried about traffic, right? So I think, for the most part, the stability issues in Guatemala, none of them were things that should be of real concern to expats, and certainly not of concern to tourists. Again, I'm not including how it's going to impact your ability to move from town to town during your vacation. If you're on vacation, you've only got three days and you're stuck for six hours in traffic because of a protest, that has a big negative impact on your vacation. But it's not scary, it's not like you're concerned, it's just that's annoying. Same thing, what if there was a mudslide? You'd have the same problem, right? And I've been there with a mudslide, had that problem. Right? Real problems in Guatemala. If you're vacationing in Guatemala, always look to plan around road closures. They have major road problems because they're very mountainous, especially where their populations are. But that's an aside. Okay, so the political instability that we see in all of these regions and the ones that people project as potential uh, instability in the others, El Salvador and Nicaragua, even if all of them went through major political instability, one of the things that's great about being an expat is that you are more insulated from political instability and its effects on you than just about any other member of society. You are not part of the political system, so you're not on one side or the other, or you should hope you're not. Under normal circumstances, as a true expat acting as an expat, and especially as a tourist acting as a tourist, yes, you're going to care about airport closures, road closures, and those things. You do not care about the stability of a government. That's simply never, by definition, as being an expat, there's nothing about that that you would care about. And people come up with weird hypothetical scenarios that have never played out in the real world. Well, but a new government could come in and decide to execute all the expats. No, they can't actually. That triggers a war and they would be invaded by an outside country immediately. That is not something that's going to happen. It's not something that has happened. It is just not realistic. So yes, you can contrive a scenario. Oh, the government changes and now meteors are drawn in by the magnetic personality of the new government officials and those meteors are pulled in from space and they annihilate the country and all the expats who live there die. Yes, you can make up completely fake things that make no sense, but of things that are actually real, there's no actual concern. They're in the most extreme cases. And we're talking really extreme. Extreme that you're going to struggle to come up with scenarios that don't involve a war happening where you could have a situation where expats felt that they had to actually leave. And not just temporarily, but actually need to leave. Guatemala is having this massive, you know, overthrow of the government and they're, they're not going to honor their elections and the, and the indigenous community is rising up and the roads are closed and all these things. As an expat, you just don't care. You don't care about the political stuff. You care about the roads being open and being able to get fresh food in your market and, and that the prices stay good for you and all those things. Those things impact you and you care about that. And you care about the lives of your friends, but you care about them whether you're an expat or living there currently or not. If you get to that point and things get so bad that you feel that there's some amount of danger, which is almost certainly perceived and not real. Of course, some danger can increase, but it's not like you're really in danger. Uh, if you feel that it's just a bad investment, it's a bad time to be there, whatever, you're an expat. You can just leave. You can just move on to the next country. You're in Guatemala, just go to Mexico, go to El Salvador, go to Honduras, come here to Nicaragua. You can just go on to the next country. And I understand that's inconvenient, but it's like saying, what if things went really bad in New York? Well, just move to Massachusetts or Vermont or Ohio or Pennsylvania. They're very, very close. In the United States, you would say, well, I don't want to do that, but people do it every day, right? How many people have moved from Texas to some other state because they feel that they're being oppressed in Texas? And how many people are feeling that they're being oppressed in California and move to Texas? Because being oppressed is perspective, right? So they're going both directions. I mean, people do it in the United States all the time over distances that are 10 or 20 times farther than you would have to do here. So 
it's a normal behavior in the U.S. or Canada to do that. I understand only a small percentage of people need to do that, but people do it every day. And here in Central America, people don't do it every day because they don't need to. They don't feel that pressure. But should it get as bad as the U.S. is right now, and you felt the need to switch to a different jurisdiction, you can just pack up and do that. Again, I understand getting rid of your house, switching up an apartment, moving your dogs, getting in a car, actually making a trip, all those things sound like you're doing a big thing, and it's not nothing. But it's not the big deal that people make it feel like. So you have, as an expat, this worst case scenario exit strategy that is so good and strong and easy that it really blows away the possibility of things like political stability being an actual issue. You just don't have to worry about those things. Until someone's closing a border, putting military on the border, and forbidding you to leave the country, and forbidding your, your uh, home jurisdiction from uh, uh, getting you out, which doesn't really happen. That's not really something to be concerned about, right? We're contriving scenarios for the purpose of, and once you're, doing, once you're getting to any of those levels, you have to move to these places because you can apply all those logics to the places you already are, right? So at that point, everything gets silly. So it, you can't use that kind of logic. It's a straw man. So here, you really are good. All of these countries are going to be fine. Um, you know, there's not a single one in the region where its political stability is going to have a negative impact on you as a tourist or as an expat just isn't. Uh, even if the worst case scenarios happens, it still won't. And if it went farther than the worst case reasonable scenario, you still have really good, simple options to mitigate that danger yourself. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, I would appreciate it a lot. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you would post on social media, just take the link from this episode and throw it on Reddit or Facebook or whatever. Tell someone you know about the show. Send it to them in email. Send them a note, whatever. Just tell them, like, check it out. It's interesting information for you. And uh, I'd really appreciate it. I will see all of you tomorrow. And once I get a chance to link the episodes, there'll be four episodes showing up on the screen. If you would just click one of those, it tells the algorithm how much you like the show more than anything else you do. I'd really appreciate it.